Let us take hands and walk together through an abandoned zoo at twilight. The zoo was once home to hundreds of species, but the cages stand empty now and devoid of scent. Did their inhabitants escape, or were they forced to watch the end of the world? Someday, friend, you'll know. Until then, discover the delight of drawing with Dolores. Greetings, listeners. Today, we're going to be drawing one of my favorite critters, and that is a, a horse. And the common American horse. So, I'm going to need you to get uh, a pencil and some paper and uh, put on your listening visor. All right, here we go. So you get your paper and your pencil and to start, we're gonna draw uh, nice and big in the middle of your paper, uh, a really simple shape and that's a heart, okay? Just a nice, very typical heart. Uh, and this, it's not going to stay a heart. It's going to be um, the rump of the horse. Uh, like I always say, I always start in the back. Because <laughs> I'm always in the back. Okay, now that you've drawn your heart, I want you right in the center of your heart, the upper center, uh, draw a simple diamond shape. Uh, not like a gem, but like a, a square that's on a point, that kind of diamond. Okay, now that you've drawn your diamond, I, I want you to extend the top left side of the diamond to a long line pointing upward. That's very nice. Uh, going out way past the heart, uh, that's going to be the top line of the horse's neck. Okay, and then uh, coming downward uh, from that, the end of that line, I want you to draw a line straight down, okay, and then uh, parallel to that long line we just drew, draw a wavy line that connects at the, the right point of your diamond, okay? Wavy line. And that... Uh, that is the bottom of the horse's hair falling down its neck. Okay, now uh, we're almost done. Uh, this is going to be simpler than you think. I always think things are complicated. Sometimes they are. Uh, coming out from the back side of, of the heart, which is also your horse's rump, uh, about uh, equal in a distance from the top of the heart as the left point of your diamond. I want you to draw a long line, a diagonal line pointing downwards. Okay? Diagonal line pointing to the down left. Okay? And then just draw a little curvy line. Uh, not wavy, just a curve that then straightens out and connects to the heart again, okay? And that is the tip of the horse's tail, peeking out from behind its rump, okay? And, uh, well, that's, that's not, <sighs> you know, I'm, 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 I'm getting real fed up with this whole shebang. I- Story time, everyone. Story time. Today's story is the conclusion of the damning of the Agonia. So you've come back. I suppose you want to hear what happened after the Agonia. That clipper on a return journey from Australia chose to take an unfortunate alternative route. Where were we with that one? 
Ah, yes. The captain, Albi was his name, had just chosen to ignore a wounded prisoner floating upon the wreckage of another ship when the men heard a terrible, blood-chilling scream. What the devil is going on now, said Captain Albi, just as a terrified man ran up from below. It was one of the trimmers, Roberts was his name, come up from the boiler room. And though his face was dirty from coal, his paleness shone through regardless. A w woman, sir, she were naked, he said. A woman, said Albie, aboard the ship, are you certain? Yes, sir, said Roberts. I was on my way back after what happened here, and then I saw her run into the boiler room, and then she screamed, sir. She screamed and run out on fire. Good God, said First Mate Barrymore. Where is she now? Roberts visibly swallowed and looked as if he might cry, a frightening sight to behold in a man of his considerable size. I surely don't know, sir, he said. I tried to find her, but there's no sign of her nowhere. Captain Albee snorted. A naked woman on fire can't simply vanish, he said, unless she was never there at all. Get back to work, Mr. Roberts. You're confused by the fog. No, sir. I'd never imagine a thing like that. Never in my life, Roberts insisted, but I'll be remained unconvinced. Get back to work and be sure to alert us all if you see any other naked nymphs, he said. In the meantime, I'll make note of the incident. Barrymore, what is the time? My watch seems to have stopped. The time was half past one in the morning. One thirty precisely and not a second more. Barrymore managed to convince Alby that perhaps a further search for the mysterious woman should be conducted after all. They had all heard her scream, he reasoned, even if Alby refused to acknowledge that the scream was, indeed, a woman's. But no woman was to be found. No sign existed of any fire, either. Alby decided against sleeping for now, and the agonia sailed on. It must have been at least an hour of gloomy silence when the ship suddenly lurched, then lurched again. Briggs, what the devil is going on? Albie asked the helmsman, but helmsman Briggs stood silently at the wheel as white as the sails. Mr. Briggs, the captain repeated. Briggs stared at the wheel as if it were a damned thing. Slowly, he turned his wide eyes to the captain, and in a voice barely more than explained that someone cold and wet had just clamped a hand over his mouth so tightly that he couldn't breathe. In his alarm, he stepped back from the helm, whereupon an invisible force took hold of it, and then disappeared into the night along with the naked lass, I suppose, said Albie, but Briggs shook his head. No, sir, he gasped. It's still there. And sure enough, the wheel, independent of any human hands, jerked hard to one side and remained there, giving the ship another jolt. Then, as if nothing had ever been there, the wheel went back to its natural position. Nothing more disturbed it. Get some rest, Mr. Briggs, said the captain. Perhaps I should too. I'm hallucinating Phantom Helmsman myself. I saw it too, Captain, said Barrymore. Are we all to rest now? Something foul is afoot in this place. Captain Alby sighed and promised to make a note of it again. The time, please, he said. Barrymore pulled out his pocket watch. Then he held it up close, perplexed. What's the matter? Is your stop too? said Alby. No, but it's... Barrymore began. Then... Mr. Briggs, what's the time on your watch? Why, it must be, began Briggs. But then he studied his watch too. It's a quarter to two, sir, but that can't be right. Albie and Barrymore checked all the timepieces aboard the ship, but all confirmed that only fifteen minutes had passed since the incident with the supposed woman. But how could this be? Surely they'd been journeying for an hour since. We're all fatigued, said Albie. Time passes more slowly in times of exhaustion. But one of us should be sensible, at least. Wake me if we encounter any more difficulties. For more than two hours, the way was calm, though the journey was slow. In the dim, the men watched those ominous rocks as if they were poised blades. 
as if at any moment a hand might reach out of the water and sever all the heads of everyone aboard the Agonia. But they were all so weary now, so frightened of this strange place in which they floated, half of them wouldn't have minded a swift conclusion. The other half attempted to amuse themselves with body tales, but the heavy air of the devil's spine dampened their mirth until they at last gave in to silence. A shout would break this nearly interminable pall, a shout of, Look! It was Barrymore himself who cried out, sweating and uncharacteristically wild-eyed. Over there, on one of the rocks, he yelled, It's the woman! Oh, but she's so old, and without a stitch of clothing on her body. The rest of the crew rushed to see this sight, but none could confirm what Barrymore saw. But she's there, said Barrymore. Can't you see? She's... Suddenly, he let out a series of hysterical shrieks as if he had seen the entrance to hell in front of him. Before anyone could stop him, Barrymore ran and cast himself off the deck and into the turning black abyss. Every able man, save the sleeping captain, searched the water from above to the best of their abilities, but there was no sign of the first mate, and it was far too dangerous to dive in after the poor soul. How long has he been out there? asked the ship's steward, Berender. By now he's surely done for. A murmur spread throughout the crew as those with eyes on a timepiece saw something they could not believe. The time was five minutes until two o'clock. Merely ten minutes had passed since some invisible spirit took hold of the wheel, and yet every man awake would have sworn his mother's soul that more than three hours had gone by. Could it be some atmospheric phenomenon playing with the mechanism of every clock aboard the ship? Not so, the men reasoned, for by now the sun should have begun to lighten the sky, but all the world existed as if frozen in place, and it was getting worse. The man Beringer shook his head and grimaced. There's some evil about this place, he said. It's not just stories, not the fog playing with our heads, not weariness. Men, it's time we got out, while we still can. Moments later, Captain Albee awoke to find his cabin overflowing with his own crew, all of whom glared at him expectantly. What's going on, he asked. Where's Barrymore? Barrymore's dead, said Beringer, and so will be the rest of us if we don't turn around. Begging your pardon, Captain, but this isn't a request. Albee refused to believe their tales of evil spirits wreaking havoc with time itself, but even he recognized his options were few. So be it, he said. Do as you will. There was a cheer amongst the men as they set to work. Soon they would be free. They would be away from this forsaken place. Only God knew how they'd make it home with what supplies they had left, but at least there was hope now. Even Albi, dejected in his defeat, had to admit to himself a sense of relief in being done with these dreaded serpentine rocks. If only it could have been. Just as the Agonia turned round, a hulking shape loomed from out of the mist, so terrible that even Albi gasped in horror. Ah, yes, you've guessed correctly, my pets. These poor doomed men had just witnessed what remained of the revelation still ablaze. There was no time to prevent a collision. The Agonia struck the revelation on her port side, shearing off the outer hulls of both ships. Instantly, the latter's raging flames leapt to the other, engulfing both in the tongues of hell. Every man still living aboard the Agonia felt the flames swallow him whole, and with it, the final thud of the last moving second of time. Yes, here at the center of the Devil's Spine, time that once moved slowly had now completely stopped with every man aboard the Agonia fixed in that moment. They live, children, but they burn, and they will burn forever. Captain Albee's last thoughts, the thoughts that persist even now, are of his own damning words, which he hears forever in the voice of his missus back at home. For some men, tis better to die than to live.
Mercy me, add sailing ships to my nightmares. Same here, and water while you're at it. But why be afraid of water? You know how to swim. I do, but I mean... Oh, I get it. It's the bacteria you're afraid of. Well, actually... Well, you shouldn't be afraid of that. A spoonful of Dandivine wipes out all possible microorganisms. Now I never have to worry about anything living in my water. Well, gee, that seems a little extreme. Can it really do that? Of course it can, silly. And did you know that whatever uninvited organisms Dandivine kills, it replaces with refreshing vitamins H and Z. H and Z? 100%. I can see you don't believe me. Try it. Mm. Well, I'll be. I don't feel one thing living inside me. Not one thing. That's some kind of magic. That's dandy fine. Let's listen in on our inside voices. I don't understand. I just don't understand. I practice all the time. But no matter what I try to draw, it never comes out right. And people say, think of it as a happy accident, but they're just trying to let me down gently. People also say, God may have a different plan for you. Or you're a nice gal, but I've always thought of you like a sister. Or Mr. Muffins isn't fat, he's just fluffy. And you know what? They're just telling me stories. Well, I don't tell stories, I tell pictures. Those other artists laughing at me from their high dollar booths at the state fair. Well, no wonder I didn't sell any of my work. They put my kiosk behind the cornhole games. Nobody's gonna buy art from an artist who keeps getting hit with bean bags. I talked to the officials about that, but they just patronize me like they do every year. Now, now, we don't want to make a scene. Well, you know what? I am making a scene. I, I have my own show on the radio. You don't see Barbara Mackey on the radio with her cheap oil paintings. I bet they aren't even really oil. I bet she uses acrylics. One of these days, I'm gonna walk right up to her stall at the farmer's market. I'm gonna splash cold soup all over her landscapes. Oops. Oh, why is it running, Barbara? Why are you covering up your art now, Barbara? What are you trying to hide, Barbara? I'm not gonna let them bother me anymore. I'll just keep marching to the beat of my own tom-tom. The universe speaks through my hands. And who, who would I be to deny the universe? Oh, now my hot pocket is getting cold. Just like my heart. And now, ask. Taylor writes, I fear the dark. How does one come to terms with the night? Dearest Taylor, I'm here for you. And I think I have a little something that will help. When you're alone in your bed and get a vision in your head and it's frightful. Just sing this little song, it'll never do you wrong and it's delightful. One devil, two devils, three devils, four. Cut off all their heads and let them roll across the floor. And make a stew to bring to your neighbor. You'll have a friend to lighten your labor. One vampire, two vampires, three vampires, four. Get yourself a sunlight and there won't be any more. Now get a bowl and scoop up the juices. You'd be surprised by all the many uses. One spirit, two spirits, three spirits, four. Better make your peace with them. They can't harm any more. Now go to sleep and dream of the morning. That's when the witches will strike without warning. Good night, Taylor. I hope this brings you comfort. If any other listeners carry a question in the caverns of their souls, you may ask by singing into the mouth of a sleeping sparrow or by sending a letter to ask at goodnightdearmargaret.com. Tell me a story of the last goodbye you remember. 
How did you say it? Was it with laughter, a carefree wave? Was it with tears and a loving embrace? Or was it a different sort of goodbye? The kind not said with words, but with silence. Do they know you said goodbye? Don't they deserve to? Don't they realize the empty space inside them once was occupied by you? What words have you screamed 100,000 times without ever opening your mouth? Tell me that story. Tell me that story. I'm listening. And now it's time to go back before we reach the end of the zoo. I'm sorry that I have to leave you, friend, but thank you for coming along. Good night, good night, dear Margaret. May angels bring you dreams. And when comes the sun, dear Margaret, we hope they'll allow you to wait. Good Night, Dear Margaret is written, produced, and narrated by me, Katie Towell. New episodes are posted monthly with a bonus episode for Patreon patrons. Special thanks go out to Chaz Simmons and Colin Hamilton for your support. To learn more, including how to subscribe and support the podcast, visit goodnightdearmargaret.com. Thank you.